the ONC since 19, and he's been focused on the development of management plans for the ONC since 1990. He led the vegetation monitor uh, modeling for the Western for the Western Oregon 2008 RMPs, in other words, Whopper. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Some people, <laughs> we're still at that, so. Um, uh, he uh, served in technical support role, and he served in a technical support role on the governor's panel on the ONC. He's retired from the BLM in December 2012, and he has C. Cadwell Consulting LLC, representing the Association of ONC Counties in the RMPs for Western Oregon, and he had great patience as I totally messed up his bio, so <laughs> please join me in welcoming Chris. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Some other things you think about the checkerboard is the BLM is not the Forest Service. These are very unique lands. They're in a checkerboard plant pattern, and there's an intermingled road network that provides access to the private industrial lands, to county lands, to state lands, to tribal lands, and also private residences. This road network is not controlled by the BLM. It's a shared network um, across this ownership pattern and provides public access. <clears throat> Another thing, and I put this in the category of you don't know what you've got till it's gone, the BLM infrastructure. Jenny has a staff of professionals for the Eugene District, and I used to be working for, for this organization. These are really highly coveted positions. These people that come here, come here with passion. They are the tops in their field. And they come and the staff stays way longer than the managers do. Most of these folks come and they camp out. And they're really, really good at what they do. And that it's it's an underappreciated aspect of the BLM is this professional cadre of people that they have that really care about these things. Along with the facilities that the BLM has, records and data, I've seen your guys' website, you must have gotten a lot of that data from, from the BLM. And the sweet part of the deal is Congress funds all this work. It's there for free right now, so don't appreciate what you got till it's gone. Think of the BLM infrastructure. But my main topic here today is sustained yield management and revenue for the counties, which has its origins in the ONC Act. It's the two primary things that the ONC Act directed to have happen. Manage these lands according to sustained yield and generate revenue for the counties. Why did that deal come about? These lands, prior to the ONC Act, were destined to go to private ownership, which would be taxed. That deal, through corruption of the way that was working through the ONC Railroad, trying to sell those lands, did not happen. Counties were not receiving revenues from these lands. They were knocking at Congress's door saying, we are entitled to something here. The government said, okay, we're going to invest these lands. We're going to keep them in federal ownership. And in return for that, not the federal government not paying taxes, it was a revenue stream for the counties as the origin of the ONC Act. I'm a forester, and in foresters you have very few heroes. David T. Mason is one of my heroes. He's <laughs> a protege of, of Gifford Pinchot. He popped out of Yale Forestry School way, way back at the turn of the century when the national forest system was first being developed, he was sent out west to go figure out what's going on with the industry out there and these potential federal lands and, and report back to us. So he was an early forester out here. He also was commandeered in World War I to go to France to develop lumbering operations to produce lumber for the war effort. So they, they hand-grabbed this guy and sent him off and made him a commander of logging in France during World War I. But he is a guy. He comes back and becomes a professor at Berkeley in forestry and starts teaching forestry in the West. He becomes the president of the Pine Board. And at the time before the ONC Act, private lands and these, these lands that would become the BLM lands, they were being logged in whole watersheds at a time. Reforestation was not even given a thought. It was moving those logs out. Industry was growing like crazy. And when David T. Mason came in and he says, you know, you guys are you're just overcutting this land and you're driving your prices down. And he came up with this idea of sustained yield. And he sold it to industry first. <laughs> but he also had the ear of the Secretary of Interior at the time. And, and written into the ONC Act, first really conservation measure for federal lands is timber land shall be managed for permanent forest production. And the timber thereon shall be sold, cut, and removed in conformity with the principles of sustained yield. This was, you need to pay attention to what you're doing and make sure you have a sustainable supply. You're reforesting these lands. You're cutting it at a rate which you can sustain. Basic definition of sustained yield. The volume of timber that a forest can be produced continuously at a given intensity of management. 
last point I want to make about David T. Mason is Mason, Bruce, and Gerard Old, as far as consulting organization in the United States, is still in existence in Portland. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to give you an overview comparison of three sustained yield strategies, extracting out of these volumes of stuff to try and boil it down into some key relationships that you may not fully understand. You can use the Northwest Forest Plan, which I refer to as the 1995 RFP. The Northwest Forest Plan was a three-state plan for all federal lands. The, the way that's applied to the BLM portion is development of a resource management plan. They took the principles of the Northwest Forest Plan and they wrote a specific management plan in conformance with the Northwest Forest Plan called the 1995 RMP. Western Oregon Plan Revision, 2008 RMP. And the status quo policy, which I'll tell you what that is about when we get there. We start off with the 1995 RMPs, six individual management plans written for each specific district that is based on the principles of the Northwest Forest Plan. And in a simplistic way, I'm just going to describe the world in these three big categories. And it's allocations by part harvest objective. So under the Northwest Forest Plan 95 RMP, it established about half the lands are in absolute reserves. <coughs> this is all the older forest in late successional reserves. It's all the congressionally withdrawn areas. It's all the lands not suitable for the timber production, the rec sites, the ACDCs, all those sites, like about half the land. Then there were lands allocated as reserve. This is primarily late successional reserves and riparian reserves. Where in the younger stands that exist in those allocations, some harvest could occur, but it's purely for harvest object for harvest object harvest to achieve the reserve land objectives. So generally, advancing the development of late succession forest is the primary objective of that. Timber that comes off that is a byproduct; it's not a goal unto itself. And then about a little more than a quarter was the land dedicated to sustained yield management under the Northwest Forest Plan. The first estimation back in 95 was about 200 million board feet. We knew very little about the extent of the riparian network. We did not have GIS data on that, and we did a sample-based guess on that, the best we could in 1995. When the 2008 RMP, we had that entire network mapped. So we, that was the largest factor. And when we re-estimated that, it's not that there's less protection for riparian, but we could calculate it better. And the, the potential under the Northwest Forest Plan is 268 million board feet off that land base, if it was managed as the Northwest Forest Plan is in. So I'm going to talk about this under the Northwest Forest Plan, that 27%, the sustained yield lands and the allowable sale quantity. How this turn out? Well, the development of doing 200 million board feet on a sustainable basis was, was had its foundation in that about 160 million would come from regeneration harvest and about 40 million would come from cleaning. A cycle of thin and much younger, goes to maturity, regeneration harvest, repeat the cycle. So when we look at sold sales over the lifespan of the plan, that early in the Northwest Forest Plan, the agencies were ramping up to achieve the regeneration harvest levels. And that soon dropped off. That was replaced by a thinning only approach, and that was exceeding what the sustained capability of thinning by many, many tons. So when you look at the total, what happened over this time span of 95 to 2010, the plan assumptions would have produced about 3 billion board feet for the economy of Oregon, mostly from regeneration harvest, some from thinning. As it turns out, sold sales were two billion, so there's a, a billion board feet that the Northwest Forest Plan 
assumed that was never delivered in implementation. And this style of implementation, this thing, it's a lower value material that has higher logging costs. That under secure rural schools, when these counties are receiving payments despite what's going on, well, nobody really cares. BLM had a commitment they were going to produce 200 million board feet. They resorted to thinning to make that happen. But with the advent of secure rural schools going away, it changes the entire equation. So what happened? A multitude of reasons. Survey and manage, the estimation of, I was on the, the FEMAP team, when survey and manage came in at the 11th hour, it was assumed these are very, very rare species. We're hardly going to find any of them. We have this vast reserve network. This is not going to be a problem, was the thinking at the time. It's what was sold to the administration. Protest initially started over true old growth sales of the harvest of truly old growth sales. Um, that fierce opposition. But as time has gone on, any regeneration harvest um, in Roseburg, the kindest and gentlest sort of regeneration harvest is being proposed by Johnson and Franklin is instantly seen. Owl sites in Southwest Oregon, the Northwest Forest Plan, design was an ecosystem approach. Large blocks of reserves that they were trying to get away from single species management, yet through consultation, the BLM was forced back into managing site after site out in the small portion in the matrix. Litigation, as I mentioned before, riparian reserves were intended to be interim widths until watershed analysis was, was conducted. The FEMAT scientists, if you talk to them, Gordon Reeves about this, they assume we would be going back to something closer to a one site potential tree eventually. The burden of proof of using a non-decision document like watershed analysis was too hard to carry to have any legal standing to make these sorts of changes so the agencies go, we live with these white wits. It wasn't worth the effort. And then various cycles of recovery plan and critical habitat. The Northwest Forest Plan, if you read in the back end of it, they said, Fish and Wildlife Service, please amend your critical habitat for the spotted owl to conform to the late successional reserves. Fish and Wildlife Service never did it until they were sued. They did it one time. And as soon as Fish and Wildlife Service goes and develops a potential critical habitat map, the agencies stand up and say, we think that's where we're going, and they avoid those areas. So, the agency was committed to try and do 200 million board feet, deliver that to the economy of Oregon. But these sorts of challenges precluded the style of management that the Northwest Forest Plan assumed. Um, and the agency's hands were tied to be able to implement it as designed. So everyone looks at the settlement agreement was the reason that the 2008 RMP happened. That certainly provided a source of funding to do the most in-depth study of four years on the ONC land that has ever been conducted, probably ever will. But by federal regulation, BLM needs to keep their plans current. They evaluated their plans twice and said, timber objectives not being met, check. Second evaluation, timber objectives not being met, check. That is an automatic NEPA requirement. You need to revise your plans. That is the policy reason that the 2008 RMP would have happened with or without settlement. So what that 2008 RMP management plan look like in the same <coughs> allocations? About a third in reserves where there's no harvest. Similar amount to reserves were byproduct harvests. They had a large block network similar to LSRs. They had a riparian strategy that um, thinning would occur for riparian objectives. And 45% in the sustained yield plan base. By contrast, you remember the 95 RMP, 27% versus 45% in that orange. Sustained yield harvest assumptions, percent of the total forest acres harvested in the first decade. So I'm talking about the full 2.2 million acres of forest here. 
And under the 1995 RMP, in a decade's time, and this holds pretty steady as you look out of this over the decades, 2.7% of that land would be subject to regeneration harvest. If you think of private industrial lands, where most of their land base is in the sustained yield management base, and you think they run on, say, a 50-year rotation, that's 20% of your land that you need to harvest every year. So these are the federal lands, because they retain trees to maturity, the rate of this harvest is much less than anything we see on private lands. So how'd that 2008 RMP look like in this picture? 3.5% versus 2.7% under 2008 of RMP. These were clear cuts, more efficient removal of volume than the tree retention of the 1995 RMP, but only you know, an uptick of about a percent in the amount of regeneration harvest. It was a management choice to maximize the thinning under the 2008 RMP. Our silviculture scheme, which was never well advertised, was a very heavy cycle of, of thinnings before regeneration harvest, a favoring of thinning before regeneration harvest. Had a bigger land base, so there was more of it to do that. So key features of the 2008 RMP, the spotted owl large block habitat. These were based where blocks could develop the fastest on a checkerboard landscape. When the Northwest Forest Plan got around, it was Johnson and Franklin and the Gang of Four drawing lines around very large maps of the first hand-drawn maps of the Forest Commission. There was no GIS when the Northwest Forest Plan was developed that had sand maps. They laid out, they rented the Coliseum in Portland, and all the administrative units brought paper maps to lay on the floor. And they sat around and they designed the LSR drawing lines. This modeling was based on a team I led of a lot of smart GIS people and biologists, both within the agency and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we developed a model that grew the forest without harvest so we could see where do we get concentrations of habitat fastest on this landscape. It's a heck of a piece of work. And it met scientifically established standards for if you're looking at an owl conservation strategy, how big does a block need to be, how close does it need to be to the next one, what sort of connectivity do you need in between. And, and at the time, it was when federal government was what I thought was at its best. We were, Fish and Wildlife Service was helping us design, this is how you need to test it, and we'd turn our GIS loose to produce results that they helped us evaluate and we jointly divide, designed the reserve network, and it was adopted as critical habitat. It was beauty in government working together that I've never, ever seen it since. The riparian strategy, similar functionality to the Northwest Forest Plan with the standards of providing fish habitat and clean water standards, based on one site potential tree on fish bearing streams and a half a potential site tree on non-fish streams. If you look at the functionality standards to provide temp to control temperatures gauged by shade and sedimentation, you could do those things with one site potential tree for fish, and when you know, with fish aren't present, it's temperature, you can achieve that with a half site potential tree. Our fish biologist and hydrologist were working with Gordon Reeves and, and a guy called Dan Miller that wrote these fairly complicated algorithms that have turned into NetMap that people are now using to design and tailor repairing strategies to the exact layout of what the land provides. The BLM was doing all that work back in 2008. Uneven age management in Southwest Oregon for fire resiliency. NOAA Harvest stands 160 years and older for 15 years. This was a direct cue from the Fish and Wildlife Service. They're going, we have this barred owl invasion. We think we, until we figure this out, we're not saying a prohibition of harvest of all older forests, but until we figure this out, could you just not harvest that for a 10-year period of time? BLM said it takes us five years to make an adjustment afterwards for that, so we're going to sign up for 15, was our assumption. So under 2008, the reasoning was to understand barred out pressures, which is why 
160 plus was taken off the table for 15 years. Produced 502 million board feet of sustainable timber harvest, would have provided 74 million of the county's annual receipts. This last one I call the status quo policy. So 2008 RMP decision was signed. The administration came in, withdrew those plans. Litigation came at the administration from all sides on this. The administration declined to support these plans, did not go to court to, to fight those challenges. So the 2008 RMP was withdrawn. We are on return to the 95 RMP. The recovery plan was withdrawn, the critical habitat was withdrawn, the Fish and Wildlife Service was sent off and developed a new recovery plan and designated 53% of the ONC lands as critical habitat and did it with the EA. Assessing that status quo policy of Northwest Forest Plans, and you still got all that going on with the LSRs, the riparian reserves, that remaining matrix, and you put on top of it, 53% is now critical habitat. Basically, anything that's in habitat condition within critical habitat, it will be a tall order to conduct harvest on that. Maybe some of the younger stands within Critical habitat can be thin to advance the development of, of habitat. So this land base gets a little bigger, this one shrinks. Recovery Action 32 retain all complex forest. Recovery Action 10 retain habitat around owl sites, something way above and beyond the Northwest Forest Plan did no site management. Um, has reduced the sustained yield land base to something about 10%. So I'm going to give you a comparison of strategies, and don't feel bad if, if, uh, if you don't get this on the, on the first take. Some people get this and some just go So I do this capacity comparison to try and put things oranges to oranges. And I'm going to compare sp first spotted owl habitat capacity. So imagine 20 years, spotted owl habitat that we have today, 1.1 million acres. Without harvest, there would be 1.5 million acres on the Yellow landscape in 20 years. That's maximum capacity to produce owl habitat off this landscape. Sustained yield timber production capacity. All lands managed exclusively for timber production, solely timber production. 1.2 billion board feet every year. Capacity of timber, capacity of owls. So we look at under no harvest, and we look at spotted owl habitat and the sustained yield output of that, you're getting no sustained yield, you're getting maximum capacity to produce owl habitat. We look at maximum sustained yield, 1.2 billion per year for 20 years, that sustained yield capacity we still have 72% of what the capacity to produce over 20 years of spotted owl habitat. How can that be? The land base is harvested very, very slowly over time. It does not all remove at once because it's designated as the timber area. And the style of BLI management, they grow these trees to maturity before they're harvested. It is not like what you see on private lands where every 40 years they're in cycling this. It's more like 110 or 120 years. 2008 RMP, 81% of owl habitat capacity and about 42% capacity for, for timber. 1995 RMP, we're ticking up a little bit in the habitat potential and about half the timber production on a sustainable basis. Status quo, another half reduction in the timber capacity and a very, very small increment of increase in potential of habitat over 20 years. So the takeaway of this is, it's not that this level of protection for spotted owl is not good, but it's coming at a disproportionate impact on the production of sustained yield management and the commodity production that leads to jobs and revenue. And you can, my thesis here is you can have it all. <clears throat> it's the 
sustain yield management and economic stability for the local communities. The takeaway here is this is two dimensions. Everybody understands timber supply comes to jobs and provides materials to the infrastructure. But people with secure rural schools have lost touch that this is under the ONC Act. These lands are to be managed to produce a revenue stream for the counties. Is it to make the counties whole 100%? No. And the counties admit that. The counties are very willing to understand it's not a, a exclusive use only for timber. They understand the stability and certainty that these maintenance of owl habitat is essential, maintenance of clean water is essential, and fish populations are essential. But you can do these things simultaneously. Sustain yield management, the recreation facilities, they are not going away under these strategies. Protection of watersheds, the standards which they do these things in, they are going to ensure that there's protection for watersheds and regulation stream flow. So the first comparable with the state director, Walter Horning, said contributing to the economic stability of local communities and industries is a primary and mandatory function of the LNC administration as provided by the Act of 1937. Payments to counties, there have been several different schemes to develop some monies to the county. The rolling average is what you see at the end in today's dollars, what they have historically had. So you have that historic average. The Northwest Forest Plan assumed that $40 million would go to the counties. If we look at the thinning style, low value, high logging cost material, of 200 million board feet, that would be about 23% of that anticipated level. Return to receipts will be a big shock to community services. 2008 RMP forecasted 74 million. The DeFazio proposal is assessed by the governor's panel, the ONC land report. And then ecological forestry with critical habitat, which is a close approximation to the widened proposal. So I'm wrapping up here, why everyone should care is management of the ONC forest and county revenue leads to county services. You don't know what you've got to it's gone message. That the counties, as Jay can attest to when he's up here in the panel, this relationship of everybody should care about the management of these forests because it does provide the services that you've grown accustomed to. Certainly jobs and sustainable and renewable forest products. I mean, holy smokes, who invented Douglas fir? <laughs> Seed to the ground, soil, water, produces a lovely product, and forest in between. And other benefits of managed forest of clean water, fish, wildlife, and recreation of water. The simultaneous achievement of all these objectives, I've studied this with a lot of smart people. I know there are sweet spots that could be, it's not everybody getting everything, but that you can achieve all of these things simultaneously if you give it a chance. My three principles for a foundation of a durable solution is continued protection of special places. Even all legislation is given new designations as part of their deal. Meeting the biological needs for wildlife, water, and fish, if it's a need base rather than more is better, you will get there. And sustain yield management for jobs and, and revenue for county services. I'm just about there. You can read those. Those are Doug Robertson's measures of success. Reasonable level, predictable in implementation, reasonable level of revenue, and reduced lit litigation and certainty. Congress is in this game because of the certainty aspect. BLM can develop the greatest plan in the world, go to court, repeat, rinse, go to court. Congress is going to step in here. So what comes next? Congress. Peter DeFazio and his partners have a proposal out on the table. Mr. Wyden has a proposal out there that will come up for a, a vote in the Senate, headed for conference, some sort of compromise. And you have the BLM planning process that has a completion date of 2015 going on. Actually, 
Thank you. Questions can be written to be submitted later. And this photo is courtesy of one of Norm Johnson's graduate students. I think it's the coolest picture of the So he hangs on his expensive camera. I wish I had left out of our camera. It's fine. Holy <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you.
at our uh, Springfield Interagency Office there at the National Guard building there in, in Springfield. Um, you're welcome to come. It's going to be starting at 5 o'clock and ending at 8 o'clock. And what we're really going to focus in, in on is the preliminary alternatives. And with that, the question that we'd like, there's really two objectives for the meeting. One is to hear from you whether or not these preliminary alternatives meet any interest that you may have. So, for example, our alternatives for recreation range from basically maintain existing facilities to build out to the maximum possible. So probably somewhere in there, if you're a recreation enthusiast that wants to be a mountain biker, your interests would be represented within those ranges, maximum build out to maintain existing facilities. We also, uh, the other things that the alternatives primarily vary on is species protection. So maintain existing critical habitat for the owl, for example, to providing more or less of that. And then, of course, you know, we have, as, as Chris mentioned in his, his show, we've got the balance between species protection and um, sustainable timber harvest. They can't both happen on the same piece of ground. So the bigger reserve system we have for species protection, the smaller the harvest land base, and vice versa. So it should be an interesting discussion. That uh, the planning criteria is open for public comment through uh, March 31st. So if you do want to be involved with that, now's the time to go ahead and get on it. There's, uh, as I said, there's going to be a public meeting in Eugene on the 5th. We're also going to be having a public meeting in Roseburg, one in uh, Salem, one in Medford, and one in Coos Bay. If there's other places that you'd like to travel. So that's really all I have to say. I think there's, gonna, there's been a lot of opportunities for public comment during this planning process so far. There will be additional opportunities to do that later. Where we are in our time frame is we, we produce the planning criteria. We start getting busy doing our analysis. We're supposed to have our draft EIS by winter of 2014. And then the final EIS and the, and the record of decision would be published in 2015. Uh, it takes a long time. It takes a long time because of federal government processes regarding our plan. And it also takes a long time because we're required to hear from you. So I, I encourage you to take that opportunity and, and provide the feedback if you'd like. And hopefully we'll see you in March 5th. Thank you. So um, I'll stand up also. Um, so I don't get Jenny when I start. Thank you. Uh, so, I want to just talk a little bit about Lane County's financial situation and how it ties to timber harvest receipts and what those mean to the county in the way of services and try and tie it a little bit together, I'm not looking to advocate for one plan versus another, just try and connect the dots a little bit historically on how the county's been funded. Over the last three years that I've been a commissioner, the three budget cycles I've been in, I've gone from a $600 million um, annual budget to a $480 million annual budget. That's a 20% decrease in revenue available. So that just, in three years, in tracking the entire county, that's health and human services, roads, everything, 20%. So sometimes when you guys wonder why you can't get response for a sheriff out here for property crime, just kind of keep that in the back of your head. That's just the last three years of contraction we've had. The contraction started a long time ago, and we've been way behind even keep coming anywhere close to keeping up with inflation for years. So we've been having this steady decrease in our ability to fund services for a long time. And you've probably all seen graphs like this before, but I'll just kind of hold it up kind of see the big tail off, that's, that's the SRS funding, what it's done over the last several years, basically going to zero. The only reason we're not going to be in major budget cuts this coming year is we saved the last SRS payment that came in after we had already adopted the 13-14 budget for the 14-15 budget, and that's filling the holes in our budget for next year. Our 15-16 budget, we're going to be millions of dollars in the hole unless something happens with Congress. Um, you know, right now, we've finally gotten back to 24-hour Sheriff's Patrol after getting some better definitions of what we could transfer out of the road fund. That's generating a whole other issue that we're running into road fund financial problems that are coming down the road and our ability to fund our roads. But to kind of give you a little bit of perspective, 
Traditionally, we've had as much as $45 million come in to Lane County in road funds and, and general funds approximately uh, through the SRS payments when it was at its peak. If you were to project that today with inflation and all that, you might get up a little bit above $50 million or so. We're somewhere between $60 and $80 million short on funding in the average public safety system compared to the state averages. And Oregon is below the national average in police officers per capita, in jail beds per capita, in you know, addiction treatment, all those various things that come into a public safety system. So even if we were to get back to what we were fully funded under SRS with inflation, we still couldn't completely close our gaps in lack of service. So I don't want to paint the picture that fixing the forest problem is going to automatically fix every problem for Lane County. So one of the things we did was we went out to the public and asked the public to try and help us fix part of the problem. We had the jail levy that we passed. That jail levy generates between 12 and 14 million a year, depending on, on how much compression and collection rates and everything. The cost of the Big Windy Complex and the Douglas Complex fires last summer to fight those fires was more than the total amount our levy will raise in the five years the levy is present. If that kind of gives you a little bit of perspective of what dealing with you know, forest management might be able to, I'd much rather spend those resources on the public safety system. So there's this tie between, historically, between forest revenue and county revenue that the ONC lands provided, and also the Federal Forest Service. The Federal Forest Service lands mostly provide road funds. Um, one of the things we've done in Oregon is we passed measures 5, 47, and 50. Those passed before we ran out of our huge reserves that were there because of the ONC lands. And the permanent tax rates that most of the ONC counties have is far below what it takes to run public services. So the, the, the necessity for timber harvest receipts in providing county services is critical. We can only do so much. At 55 cents per thousand that we passed recently, we start putting other jurisdictions into compression under those, those state laws. So as we try and raise more taxes to generate funds for services from a county that's already suffering from high unemployment, we'll start actually depressing the amount of money other agencies get because of the way measures 547 and work. So that's kind of where we are as a county fiscally. We're in this contraction, which is due to the, the, the reduction of the SRS payments and the discontinuation of harvest. And at the same time, we're limited in how much we can raise from other people. That 55 cents per thousand was a relatively small tax increase, but it didn't pass by 80% to 20%. It passed. 57 to 46, basically, it, it was not a huge victory. And in areas like this, this particular precinct that includes Mapleton, it failed. Because you, know, you guys are probably aware, there's not a lot of jobs out here. So for me, this federal forest policy, it's not only about trying to help close that gap, it can't completely close our gap in, in need for services. It's also about providing jobs so that you all can afford possibly to finish closing that gap as, as citizens and providing productive you know, employment for, for lots of rural com communities out here. That's really a big tie because employed people also don't need as many services from the county. So it's a double win. We can take those dollars from the harvest and provide services, but if we're providing them to less people because there's more employment, we can actually provide better and more services. So it's kind of a double win for the county, getting people employed and having the ability to fund services. Thank you. I'm going to talk about sausage making. The, um, the making of the laws regarding what might happen with these lands. 
Um, when originally conceived, the ONC solution was supposed to be very simple. Take this two and a half million acres of land and divide it into two pieces, approximately equal. One of those pieces would be the roadless areas and the old growth forests, the places that today remain pristine. And the other piece would be the lands that have been previously clear cut, previously logged, already roaded, devoted already to industrial forest management. And the key part of the original conception would be when you divide this baby in half, the interests who care about their respective half would be certain that they would get what's promised. So the people who would be concerned about the amount of logging would be absolutely certain that the new law would provide that amount of logging. And the people concerned about the protection of the old forests and the wilderness areas and the like would be absolutely certain that they would get those lands protected forever. But sausage making isn't very clean. <laughs> and as the various bills have moved forward, the certainty for both sides has been eroded substantially. Now, in its first iteration, the DeFazio-Walden-Schrader bill, that bill does a pretty good job of providing certainty that the logging levels would be met. And not so much on the other side of the equation. There, the old forest would simply be given to the Forest Service. Nothing else would be changed, and the Forest Service could, through its own process, decide how they would be managed. Well, that was the concession that Peter DeFazio thought he had to make to pass a bill through the Republican-controlled House. Now we turn to the Wyden bill. It has eroded even further. It doesn't provide much certainty for either side. On the timber side of the equation, the Wyden bill says, we will do planning, like the planning Ginny talks about. More planning, another EIS for a 10-year timber sale program. More planning, maybe we'll shorten some time frames, and maybe we'll require that if people want to sue us, they have to sue faster, not slower. But no, none of the certainty that the DeFazio bill attempted to provide for timber interests. And on the environmental side, his bill looks pretty good. Ah, until you read the fine print. Because all the, the bill has robust protections for old growth forests and protects some important wilderness areas. It also has a provision that allows every single one of those protections to be taken away through land exchanges of public for private land. And gosh, with that checkerboard, you don't think there'd be some land exchanges? Mm -hmm. And with the right president in the White House favoring exchanges, the entire landscape of ONC lands could be exchanged public for private. <laughs> Old growth for clear cut. <laughs> that's what the private lands are. So that's, that's the widening bill. You don't get certainty on either side of the equation. So what's going to happen now? Well, if you had asked the, uh, I'm going to try to get inside the head of our legislators, which is a kind of scary place to me. Uh, if you had asked those legislators three or four months ago, would we have an ONC bill on the president's desk by the end of this Congress, they would have said, yep, we're going to do it. Because we've got Peter DeFazio as the ranking Democrat on the House Natural Resource Committee. We've got Ron Wyden as the chairman of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Got Democrats working with Democrats. We're going to ram this thing put it on the president's desk. But Mr. Obama threw a curveball into the works. And he did a little bit of musical chairs that is basically bringing the whole thing to a halt. What he did was when Max Baucus said he was going to retire to be made ambassador to China, Mr. Wyden said, oh gosh, I'm going to scurry over and take Max's slot as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. 
And you can't be chairman of two committees at one time, which elevates the most conservative Democrat in the Senate, Louisiana's Mary Landrieu, to now be chairman of Energy and Natural Resources. And that's the committee that the ONC bill has to come out of. So what does Chairman Landrieu think about the ONC bill? That's the big question. And I'll tell you right now, she doesn't think much about it. Why is that? Well, we've gone from having a chairman of a federal timber state, the number one state in the country when it comes to federal land logging, to having a chairman with no federal timber cut in her entire state. Now, Louisiana has a robust timber industry. Make no mistake about it, it's the number two manufacturing employment in the state. But every single log comes from private land. Every single one. And there are 110,000 private woodlot owners in Louisiana who don't want to compete with the federal government in the log marketplace. And Ms. Landrieu, she knows that. And she's up for re-election this year. <laughs> and she is, in fact, the most endangered Democrat in the Senate. So you can be sure that she's going to be taking care of her home turf first and foremost. And she's not going to have a whole lot of bandwidth left for dealing with organs or <coughs> problems out there somewhere next to the Pacific Ocean. So where does that leave Ron White? What can he now do as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee to help his state? Well, his number one priority is going to be to try to help Jay out. He's going to try to renew the Secure Rural Schools program because that program originates in his new committee. And his new committee can find the dollars to pay for it. So Ron will do actually what he's best at bringing home the bacon. It's, of course, what our senior senator has always done back in the days when Mark Hatfield did that. He did a superb job of it for Oregon. And that's what Ron is going to try to do now. Make sure that federal dollars flow into counties in Oregon to compensate them for having the federal land not taxable, not subject to taxes. Where is he going to get that money? Well, you know, Mary Landry may help him there, because she wants to share more oil and gas offshore receipts from the federal leases with the states. Because she's a huge supporter of the oil and gas industry. She's from Louisiana. And she wants the federal government to drill, baby drill, on those offshore leases and take that money and buy off every state in the country and give them a little piece of that pie. And Ron's going to be there with his hat <coughs> saying, yes, I'll take it. Thank you very much. And in the meantime, these ONC force bills that you've heard so much about are, according to my crystal ball, going to go the way of 98% of all bills introduced in Congress. They'll never see the president's death. Thank you. <laughs> So are we mad yet? <laughs> After uh, all that, boy. Um, first, I want to thank the Watershed Council. Like uh, Liz said, I was there when we founded the Umpo Watershed Council. It was our, his first, uh, in his first eight years, we made the Watershed Salmon Plant. And also the Grange. I don't know if there are any Grangers here. I, I was the secretary of the Grange in Looking Glass, which is a little crossroads just west of Roseburg. And uh, I grew up uh, down in Douglas County, so the next thing I want to do is apologize because I'm new to Lane County. I'm an Umpqua River boy. And my wife and I have moved up to McKenzie Bridge uh, last, um, August 2012, or August 2012, and we have become infatuated with Lane County. I mean, you have all these rivers, including the Syusla, Blue River up by us, the Willamette, you know, just, it's just amazing because we're used to, there's only two rivers in Oregon that flow from the Cascade Mountains to the ocean. Umpqua is being one and the road being the other. So it's a whole different animal when you have to share the Willamette with all the towns downstream. So, uh, 
The next thing about my background is, uh, like she said, I've, I've been a cabinet maker for 25 years. And I've held my family. We had 200, we still have 200 acres in booking glass. It's right next to the BLM, which got us activated about forest issues. But we've been thinning and, and logging our 200 acres for decades. And uh, my dream as a furniture maker has always been to do the work from the forest floor to the showroom floor, to have a hand in all those parts, from falling the trees, setting the chokers, to running it through the table saw and a plane. So um, I feel really attached to wood. I probably uh, work with wood more than all the other panelists. But, uh, and, and I'm a numbers guy too. So I want to talk about our family's numbers. I heard a lot of you are, are landowners. So imagine if you had 100 acres. We have 200. And you heard these percentages. So I, that's why when Chris presented, I came up with these numbers that our family uses. And you may be doing the same thing. You can help. So when you hear these numbers of percentages, and you're planning your, your farm with 100 acres, let's say you have 100 acres, and you're going to you're going to clear cut a 1% a year. Well, you're going to have a 100 year rotation on that land. Does that make sense? Anybody don't get that? So every year you're going to cut 1%, which is on your 100 acres, one acre. So you do the 2%, you're going to cut two acres. You get into the 4%, like he said, the, the forest is growing 4%, you're going to cut 25 acres. <laughs> You only no, have four. four. No, no, four. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it takes 25 years. Right. But here is where we get 10 years, and what are we cutting? 10 acres. 10 acres, right. So the question for folks that want to grow old growth is like the Elliott or, or the BLM neighboring lands that may be neighboring your lands. What is the percentage and how many acres? Half a percent and a half an acre. On our place, it's a full acre, which the environmentalists say is a more natural occurring uh, situation. When you know the whole idea of clear cutting was based on fire, right? It's to duplicate nature when you clear when we burn. But what is science has found is that dead gaps are actually more real, like a half acre, one acre dead gap. That's when you have uh, diversity and you get regrowth in that dead acre. So uh, what I'm getting at with my numbers here is that you would have to look at these numbers carefully. When they say things grow 14%, especially here in the coast range, they probably do. And so we're going to cut 14%? Do the math, okay? So, I, you know, the other thing is being a woodworker and being a registered independent, I've never liked labels. And I don't like the thing about being an uh, environmentalist, which I, I've been labeled, and then the timber beast label, you know. So that's why I'm an independent. I don't like liberal and conservative, because 60% of us, the polls show in America, we agree on a lot more than, than we think. And so the, the, the trouble with this sausage making is that we should work on the things we can agree on. So to close, I want to share a parable I got from uh, Senator Tony Cochran is the senator, the majority, and the governor. And he tells me the story about when he was in the Senate. The kids over, Dr. No, was in his first eight years. And uh, the, the Republicans were in the majority. And they said, Tony, come be on our natural resources board, our, our natural resources committee. Because they knew he would vote with the environmentalists, right? So Tony's in this predicament. He's on this committee. He realizes, he goes out in the hall, talks to kids Hubbard's people, and says, what are you going to veto? And so they're going to veto the Republican plans to cut more state forests, right? So that's the situation with the father and wife. You go to, you go to Obama and you say, what are you going to veto? Well, I'm going to veto the ONC plan, just like the Waffle, right? I mean, if you're not upset about the sausage making, or you're not upset about the Lane County predicament, we should be upset about that. The fact that, that both parties are collaborating in this, this game of looking busy, 
the files are widened, looking busy. We're going to deliver the timber to you. But all the time knowing. Well, I ain't going to let that happen. You know? So, and same with the Whopper. I was really frustrated. Wrote guest columns in Roseburg. So I got all these friends. My wife, Mary, worked at the BLM, Roseburg BLM. I don't know if you knew each other. But uh, she was a field biologist. And it was just so frustrating to have all these friends working so hard, doing all this planning to, to, to have the Whopper be a train wreck. And that's what's got me frustrated about this situation again. The, the Association of Counties pushing this, this thing all the time and looking busy, we're going to deliver. And it's not going to happen. So it's really frustrating. I mean, the fact that we're here talking about it is just so frustrating. But the other thing I wanted to, uh, to share uh, uh, biologically, I wrote these ideas down. You know, you can have a healthy forest. Tons of acres of forest. But my wife's a spot on all biologist, and what I've learned going out in the field with her is just because you have forests and trees doesn't mean you have reproduction. And so that's why I wrote down you have all kitchen, good eating, no nursery. Because finding the tree to nest in is like a needle in a haystack. And you've got to have a lot of age, a lot of diversity. You just can't have a tree farm. So the fragmentation that we're seeing is a, is a big issue. So that's why you need a watershed that's whole. And that's why I'm a watershed advocate, just like the Watershed Council here. Because it's not just about the trees, it's about the salmon, it's about all the parts. It's a whole web of life, you know, including us being the neighbors up against the BLM. You know? And, and other absentee landowners, because that's what I call it. It's absentee landowners. You got people in DC managing lands they don't live there. And would, would you clear cut 120 acres if you had it? And there's you and your cabin, you know? So I just want to give you that perspective and uh, think about these numbers, and I appreciate it. Serial levies, they have to be voted on. So there, there's that. 
education and what you will tax yourselves, particularly with property tax. There are a couple of places that we can go to tax people in Oregon as a county. And serial property tax is probably our only place right now as far as, 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 far as property tax goes. We could do a county income tax. Um, there was an effort to go that direction a few years back. Uh, kind of generated a recall effort at one point. Um, so that's another, you know, it's a, it's a matter of, of uh, you know, where you go politically with some of this. Uh, there are other, you know, taxes or, or fees that we can raise. Uh, we could, you know, there's allowance in state law that we could actually match the state's vehicle registration fee 100% and double your vehicle registration fee for every two years from $86 up to $172 or whatever it is. And, uh, and we could do that even without a vote. We could just vote to do that as a board. But I guarantee if we just voted to do that, we're probably back to the recall stage. Um, and, and it's a fairly regressive way to tax people. So it, there's a lot of pieces, but there's a lot of limitations under working law. And the one place we have the most flexibility is in trying to do levies, serial levies, but there's even complications to that. At that small 55 cent level, we were causing compression of the South Lane Fire District, where they were actually losing about a dollar for every dollar we gained you know, in their area. So it was kind of, there's that, that issue, we can raise taxes to a certain point, but measure 547.50 have a cap on how much be charged to a person for general government is $10 per thousand. So in some of those jurisdictions where Cottage Grove has got their city tax, we've got ours, South Lane Fire District, and all those people on top of it, we start getting that cap of suppression that causes everybody to lose money. So that, that's another facet. Thank you, I see Patrick. So I have uh, two proposals uh, that we should write down. Uh, and to give you some background, if you call your county assessor I did in Douglas County back in 2007, and you said, what if we did put all that land to today the Roseburg Forest products? Because they always say, in lieu of taxes, right? So if that was private industrial forest land, I called Douglas County Assessor and I said, what would we get? And because we're talking half a million acres, and then a million acres of Umpqua National Forest, so half of the county, $5 million. It was quite shocking. I was thinking double digits, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're talking about in lieu of taxes. <clears throat> I don't know what the numbers are in Lane County. Like I said, I'm a new Umpqua boy. But so, as a woodworker and as a, as a lumber grower, my worry, and, and even the middles like Swanson and Superior, say the biggest impact is not the federal forest, but imports. And not just on raw logs but even more impact is the, the timber. When my brother-in-law is building houses in Sutherland with Canadian two by fours, there's a problem, mm -hmm. right? We're the timber capital of the world and we're building houses with Canadian two by fours. So, and, Defa and DeFazio gets this. But he was against NAFTA and so was Ron Paul. I mean, look at, their, look at that diametric. But who's a free trader is Wyden, sadly. Mm -hmm. We need to work on Wyden to get a, to get this globalization. So my proposal is that the safety net, because it's not just our West Coast timber dependent counties. There's North Carolina, there's Maine, there's Michigan where I was born. There are a lot of timber counties. So what we need to do, and buying plywood, I always buy RFP plywood. I buy local plywood. Not the Chinese plywood, not the Russian plywood. So what we need is a tariff on lumber, on finished lumber products. It goes into a designated fund only for timber-dependent counties. Because then you can pay it, you know, and then it gives the industry a fighting chance. You want the, the price of our lumber to compete with, with slave labor in China, right? So the other part is, speaking of China, last year, 2013, 40% increase in log exports. And like Kitsapper said, are we going to become a timber colony for Asia? We, I mean, as mill workers, my, my father worked in Dillard at the Roseburg Forest uh, plant as a particle board. 
So I, you know, it's a cliche, I'm a Tim Miller or something, but those guys should be upset for every ship of jobs that's being shipped out. And the other thing, I'm kind of one last thing, is that when you see train loads of two by fours and plywood leaving Lane County or Douglas County, those are jobs too. As a woodworker, I'd like us to see us do more with wood products that we produce. I want us to ship cabinets. I called Douglas County and said, how many manufactured homes do we have in Douglas County? 12,000. How many are made here? None. So, okay. there are solutions, but it doesn't have to be a tax. Okay, thank you. And that actually addresses several of the other questions related to financing. Um, and actually talking about um, plywood and other things uh, starts to bring us to a question that someone had. And I don't know, Jay or Andy, might, you might be able to, we'll see where this goes. Um, are there adequate industrial <laughs> facilities, um, mills uh, and the such, to um, still available to if, if the timber output were to increase? <coughs> and actually, Chris, you might, yes. whoever. Yes. Yes. They all say yes. We'll go with that. Not if you're competing with China. Okay. Not if you're competing with China. And yes, for now, from from Jay. All right. Uh, then an, another question. I'm going to keep jumping around so we can try to get everything in here. Both landscape restoration and sustainably managed timber harvest require continuous and sub and watershed or sub watershed strategies for their success. What will be done to remove the checkerboard and aggregate the lands into management units designed for productivity and protection? <laughs> Anybody take a side? Yeah, well that's interesting. I know for BLM planning purposes, we do look at the landscape level. We don't look, we look at private land conditions along with public land conditions before we plan a project. But for us to do land exchanges is a the federal government to do land exchanges is an incredibly expensive and complicated, long project. Um, back in the day, there was the famous Umpqua Land Exchange. I don't know if you remember I was that. There. Yeah, millions of dollars invested into that effort. Um, nothing ever came out of it, though. So there was, as Andy mentioned, a, a proposal in one of the one of the bills, Biden's bill, for ex exchanges, but that's you know out of uh, my hand for certain. What did come out of the Tucker Pad is a really cool tool. John Sessions, he's a forest engineer at OSU, he designed the land exchange tool. And what was neat about it when he saw it on his laptop was he could run, what's the best land exchange for Coho? And he'd run this scenario. No boundaries, you know, no, no property lines. What's the best one for spotted owl? What's the best one for timber production? The bummer about that $7 million tool is he owns it. <laughs> and that was our biggest, we were really upset, because we all liked it. We wanted to run our own scenarios, <laughs> but it's privately owned, $7 million later. All right, next question. Um, Jay, you're going to Again, with some of these, I'm trying to edit to get more question question out of them. Currently, the Sayusa National Forest is sitting without litigation while generating timber receipts. The Forest Service forests are sustaining both spotted owls and barred owls, while ONC lands have continued losses of spotted owls at more than 3% a year. As a federal agency, um, isn't the bottom line for BLM to avoid litigation and avoid federal law violations? But let's kind of get to a question. You can answer that. But uh, I think one of the questions, and that was consistent through several of these, is looking at the um, why is it not repeatable or can it be repeatable? Some of the things that are going on with the Sayusan National Forest on BLM lands. So I believe Ginny or Chris um, both be good ones to answer that, or possibly Andy. So. Well, I'll start out. I, I'd just like to point out that the Eugene District offers, well, sells 52 million more feet a year, comparable to what the Sayusla National Forest sells, and we haven't been located for at least eight years. So we are very similar to what the Sayusla National Forest is doing. We provide, oh, I calculated it the other day, I think it's 850 local jobs that are family based jobs, uh, which means 45 to 60,000 a year and uh, provide about $12 million worth of receipts. So we're doing really good work here. Uh, I think the, the, I don't know who had the question, but about the, the 
difference. Northern spotted owl, what's going on with the northern spotted owl? It's really not about habitat, it's about the barred owl. And if you're not there yet, go read the literature. The barred owl is really out competing the spotted owl throughout most of this range, and particularly the coast range. And, and you'll see that in our analysis of the management situation if you do decide to read that. So that's kind of where we're at. The, uh, the, the Cyrus Law National Forest has two major <coughs> things going on. The 96% of it, 94% of it under the forest plan is in that reserve or byproduct category. There are sustainable land base for continuous timber production, something like 6% of the land. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a tiny fraction. And the demographics of the Cyrus Law National Forest do, and the reserve network was set up in response to Marble Mirror Lots. Its proximity to the coast was the driver of the extensive amount of reserve. And then the demographics of their forest. Jimmy sits on a very young forest that's highly productive. The Sayus Law has that in spades. It had huge fires, so the starting condition, that thinning opportunity is vast. Is it sustainable? Can they do that forever? No. So their bar of sustainable harvest is very low. Their population to support thinning is very large. Any other? I would note that quite a few of their sales for thinning are going unbid recently. So they're they're hitting saturation in that market. All right. I could add uh, a thing about big logs versus little logs. There, in the whole Northwest, there are only like six mills left that need really big logs. Herbert Lumber, I mean, like two of them are in Douglas County, Herbert Lumber and, uh, anyway, Silver Butte. Or, uh, but anyway, so what I'm getting at is the majority of the mills have retooled for the smaller logs. So, so this, when we get into clear cutting old growth again, which I think it's going to start the whole timber wars thing and the tree sits. It's just going to be a disaster. I think God Obama's going to veto this plan. So the need for the big logs is, is not as much as it used to be, you know, in the 20s and 40s or 1937 when the ONCF. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, actually, speaking <laughs> of uh, big logs, I'm Fittens being sold. Are any of the sales of timber being uh, on the BLM right now being sold at a loss as has happened in past years? Well, I, that's, a, that's a challenging question for me to answer at this point since I haven't looked at it. I know that the uh, timber prices have certainly gone up. Part, as you know, part of the function of government is not just to provide for services at the heyday, it's also to provide for jobs. So certainly I recognize back in you know, the low point of the economy in 2008-2009, we were selling at the minimum value we could sell public timber at. It's a 10% farm value, they call it. And, and we were selling those sales. But as a government, we were also supporting jobs within the local community. Now we're certainly well above that minimum price. Um, we're at $250 to $300 uh, dollars per thousand board feet. It, price has really gone up. So we're, I don't know if we're selling at a loss now. I doubt it. When I think about it, we're making more than we are costing, at least from my district's perspective. The revenues that we get are more than the allocations. Okay. Um, then, Ginny, I'll keep you on the hot spot if you don't mind. <laughs> um, how do you evaluate public comments on the alternatives um, when, they're, when they're presented? For example, if 50% of the citizens who respond want max protection of endangered species, do you, do you automatically go with that alternative? No, it's not about voting. It never has been about voting. If it's about the majority feels like this or the majority feels like that, we certainly want to include your values as we go through this planning process. At this point, what we're looking at is truly that question. Is the alternatives that we have going into the analytical <coughs> process meet your is somewhere in there meet your values. So probably that maximum protection is going to be part of one of the alternatives. Really, it's not going to be, it can't be no harvest on, on uh, BLM lands because that wouldn't meet our purpose and need, which is about a sustained yield supply of timber. Um, so that's what we're really looking at at this point. So if you give us, uh, we don't like you to cut any timber, we probably won't be able to include that in our 
our uh, analysis. All right, I have a couple, I'm just gonna keep going with the questions because I wanna get through a couple more and then I'll, um, hopefully there'll be time for closing comments. So the next question is, could, um, could ONC management consist, or consist of longer rotations such as three to 500, 300 years to 500 years? Well, it could. Um, you could probably answer that. Yeah, I, that is certainly the discretion on the length of rotation when you think of how BLM allocates land. Almost every plan that's been around in, as a concept is reserving for no harvest at all, at least a third, if not half of that. And, and so if you think of it in that dimension, Half of this land is not subject to a rotation and is purely dedicated to that portion producing old forest. The other concept is the style of management that goes on if it is a longer rotation. And I want to counter what Patrick said. He's correct, the number of large log mills are very small right now, but that's totally about supply. If there was a predictable supply, American Forest Resource Council, the folks that represent the industry, said we will certainly bring that infrastructure to you. Yeah. And then if you think of it from your concerns, if you're managing in a style that that rotation produces a large log, those are very high value. Is private industry going to make that investment? No way. So the federal lands can fulfill a very just because it's a large log, you shouldn't look at it like it's bad. <laughs> and the industry, those are very valuable logs worldwide. Thank you. Next question, uh, Patrick, this is directed to you. How does your numbers model, um, how do your numbers and model change with three quarters of the land allocated to old, old growth forest? Uh, maybe I need clarification. I can. So I, I pose the question, your area control model of just percentages, it's like one style of management happens on the entire ownership. But like I just said, most of these proposals, BLM set asides for no harvest or only for reserve land objectives, half to three quarters. If your, your, your thesis there was you can't harvest more than a half a percent to produce oil growth, I would contend you're already dedicated three quarters to that, and if it's a long style rotation on the remaining part, your simple area control model just doesn't pull the water. Well, yeah, this is where the, uh, the shell number game. To, to, to start out with, like the, the Clinton's forest plan in, nine, in the 90s, 80% of the LSRs, the late successional reserves, 80% of them were second growth. Okay. Yeah, that's just a number everyone knows. That's so not, that's not true for the elements. Well, it was in Yonkwa as a whole, both the Elim and, and Yonkwa National Forest. So again, sorry my numbers are on But so that that that's alarming, right? That 80% of your reserves aren't even old growth. But they're gonna be managed to become old growth. And that's where we get into the part about the needle in the haystack. How do you grow a nest tree? So have, the scientists haven't figured that out. But the, the part he's getting at is that if you keep cutting the baby in half, and pretty soon you, you've got out of one and a half million acres, you only have half of them, or uh, 500,000 acres to, to work with. How are you going to sustainably? See, and that's, that's a joke my friend Patty Quinn, who's from Camas Valley, said when he reads the ONC Act, sustained yield versus sustainable. You sustain the beating, right? But sustainable is a different word. So when you hear the word sustained yield, it's not sustainable. And do the, do the percentages and you see that. So, um, I just modeled that. We're running out of time. Okay. okay. Uh, then, uh, a, couple of, or a couple of questions asked about herbicide use on ONC lands, both currently and in the proposals. Uh, if uh, anyone wants to comment to that, possibly. Um. They're not allowed. <coughs> oh, no, they're allowed, but they're not allowed in Eugene District. So they haven't been allowed in Eugene District since 1984. Um, they're not proposed as part of the new resource management plan. But we do have a 
tiny little, tiny little resource management plant in, uh, right outside, right inside the city limits of Eugene at the West Eugene Wetlands. And we're not, we haven't made a decision on that, but we're getting really close to, and we're talking about applying herbicides within the West Eugene Wetlands, a limited number of herbicides. As you know, that's an extremely rare endangered habitat of upland wet prairie. Uh, probably the most endangered habitat in Oregon is right there, right within the city limits of Eugene. So we're, the, we're working with a lot of different partners, including the Nature Conservancy in the city of Eugene and Lane County, in order to restore this rare habitat. We end up being the seed source for all the invasives spreading across the landscape. We've done a lot of studies on that, and uh, the only way we can effectively control those invasives is by use of herbicides. So, otherwise, we're not. It's not part of this research <coughs> plan proposal. Um, and so far, we're not applying any herbicides on the element. Thank you. Thank you all. I realize not every question was answered. We did the best we could with the time available. And thank you all for submitting your questions and for the most part being very legible. Um, so thank you, these guys for their question. Or, or, well, I can hold up.